morning. Thank you. We thank you for so many things. We thank you for giving us another day of life. We thank you for this opportunity to come and study another portion of thy will. And of course, Father, for your greatest blessing was the gift of your son. Father, as we go into this Bible study, we pray that you will help us to understand. And we also understand that one of the keys to understanding is to study your word. We thank you for your word, Father. We pray that everything that is said and done in this Bible class is in accordance with thy will. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We gave these out last week. Is there anybody that didn't get one? We had a little homework assignment for this week. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it because we're going to come back later on and spend a little bit more time on the subject, I think. Last week you we were asked to think about Jeremiah and Jesus and make some comparisons between Jeremiah and Jesus. You know, we often look at Moses as a type of Jesus. Moses was a, a prophet. Moses was a mediator, Moses was a giver of the law, and certainly Jesus was all those things. And so the, the assignment was to think about Jeremiah and Jesus, and what are some comparisons that you might draw between the two of them? Anybody give any thought to that this week? They were both prophets. Okay, they were both prophets. That were disrespected and not believed by the people. Okay, both were prophets who were disrespected and not believed, and in fact, <laughs> physically tortured by their own people. Okay, good. Anybody else? Go, go, get it. Excellent. They both, not just not just Israel, but Jerusalem. Yes, good, good point. Uh, Ma'am? I'll repeat it. They both wept over Jerusalem. They both wept over Israel. Uh, Jeremiah is willing to do that, and Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 23. Good. Got another one, Dennis? sad because people wouldn't listen to them and follow them. Jeff and then Paul. They both gave warnings. They both gave warnings? Warnings of what was about to come and what to do to avoid it. Both gave warnings. In the case of Jeremiah, none of those warnings were heeded. Uh, certainly Jesus, Christians, sure did heed those warnings when the Romans showed up, didn't they? Go, go Brother Paul. They both told the truth and were persecuted. They both told the truth and were persecuted for it. Greg? Uh, they both proclaimed the message of repentance. They, they, say, say that again. They both the message of repentance. They both preached a message, am I, am I hearing you right? They both preached a message on repentance. The necessary of, of, of genuine repentance. Not just saying I'm sorry, but being sorry and then changing. Go, Chris. They both fought their symbols and analogies. Okay, they both fought using symbols. 
symbols and that. We can stop right there because that's a perfect segue into what we're going to talk about today, but we won't. They both use a lot of symbols and analogies. Jesus in parables, and as we're going to talk about today, Jeremiah used a lot of objects in, in, in his uh, lesson. If I got any others, Mike, I think you and Debbie got a list there, don't you? Yeah, did, did we get all yours? Okay, Mike, did you have any more? Anybody else? We'll talk about this as we get toward the end of Jeremiah again. Our ne not, not next week, but our next assignment will be to, to think about some more and then to think about us today. You know, Jeremiah, Jesus, and then us today. Uh, one one, one that, 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 I, that I thought about was the fact that at the end of their lives, both of them were considered failures. Jeremiah was going to be hauled off into Egypt, going against everything that he told the people they should not do, yet he was hauled off himself into Egypt, where he, tradition and history tells us that he was stoned to death. And Jesus died on that cross. But while they both appeared, they were defeated. Both of them were in fact victorious. <coughs> they were raising up in the grave. And Jeremiah, all of his, all of his predictions uh, coming true. Anybody else before we move on? Today what I'd like us to do as we think about it, and this is a theme that we're going to see throughout, throughout Jeremiah, uh, tears, tragedy, and then ultimately triumph. Uh, but today what we're going to do is look at, begin to look at some objects that Jeremiah Um, we, uh, we're not going to get through all these today. We'll probably get through about half of them, maybe a third of them. And after this, after this slide, what we're going to go into, if you look at your, if you look at your little booklet, the next thing we're going to look at is the ones that uh, Jeremiah's case or Jeremiah's uh, charges against um, Judah. Okay, those start on page, uh, page four. Yeah, page four and five. And there's several pages of that, and we'll go through the book. And the temptation is you just go through this book a little bit. Uh, we're we're going to look, first of all, at, at Jeremiah's object lessons, and then at some point we're going to go back and hit Jeremiah's persecutions. But after this one, we're going to look at God versus Judah. God is going to bring the case against Judah. And then you go over and look at page uh, six and seven. We're going to look, look, look at those. But what I want to get to, I guess, is on page number... Uh, uh, we'll hit all these slides, but as you get over to page, uh, um, well, nine, you've got Jeremiah's assurance, and that goes all the way back to chapter one. Then we're going to look at his unpopular message concerning Babylon throughout the book of Jeremiah. And it just over and over and over, we talked about repetition last week, and, and, and we see those all the way through the book. The temptation for me today as I looked at one of these was, was to go and, and get a little deeper into what he's saying there, but then I know it's going to conflict with his message of adultery. Uh, he has a whole lot to say about harlotry, prostitution, and adultery in this book. And so we're going to look at, look at all of those. Uh, then you get into the obstacles that he's going to face, and then we get into the tears, the miseries, the mores of Jeremiah, and then uh, as you get on toward the back, and that, that's some time to go. Uh, you see, we, we're going to be going through this book several times. And so let's start right now with Jeremiah chapter 1. As we look at different, and this is a list and I, I think it's, I dare say it's almost comprehensive of all of the different objects that he is going to use in this book that God tells him to use. And the interesting thing is you study the Bible. There's going to be some implications, certainly for these people. But as we go through these, I want you to think perhaps about 
other places in the Bible where some of these objects ha 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 have come into play. And so let's look first of all at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11. It's interesting, Mike, last Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, Monday night, I guess it was Monday night, texted me and said he had found a, a, a YouTube movie on Jeremiah. And, and he said he didn't really like it because of what happened in the very first scene. And what was in the first scene you didn't like, do you remember? About some, the, the call of Jeremiah, the almond tree. Go, go ahead and say that. What you didn't like about that. Okay, you didn't like the actor that played Jeremiah, but there was, it, it was how, it was how. They had a small child represent God. Okay, a little kid representing God said, look here at the almond tree. And then probably next up it was, look at the boiling pot. Yeah, it was, it was just, a, just a little, little. And Mike sort of, I think, felt like that was sort of a diss on, diss on God. Um, God, God is not a little child. God is the all-powerful ruler of the universe. And in verse 11, this is the, we, we get the calling of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah here in, in chapter 1 is a young man. Uh, some have suggested that his prophetic career lasted 40 to 50 years. And so in the very first scene that we see God talking to Jeremiah, he tells Jeremiah to look at an almond tree. Where in the Bible do you remember, well, let, let's just read the verse. Because it's not necessarily the almond tree that reminds you of something. Chapter 1, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord. And boy, you're going to see that over and over and over again in this book. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Comes to Jeremiah saying, see, what do you see? And he said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Does that bring to anybody's mind any other situations in the Bible. Go. Yes, sir. Moses. What about Moses? Okay, the rod that, the, the, the rod that bloomed that showed that it was the Levite tribe that was going to be priests. And that rod was put in the Ark of the Covenant. One of the three things that were put in the Ark of the Covenant. What were the other two? The manna and Ten Commandments. Okay, but that rod that budded was the, one of the three things that they put in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, can you think of another place where you either see rod or, or almond tree? Okay, there is the, there is the rod of correction... Right, right, yeah. There's a rod on the pictured on the menorah. Okay, okay. Thy rod and thy staff, they shall comfort me. There's there, anybody can, can anybody think? Of it? I got I got one other one that I thought about. In the in the the one I thought about was the Book of Revelation where the, the rod of iron and, and the rod is either going to be good, it's either going to be good or bad, depending on how you accept it. Did you think of one? Okay, that's in Ecclesiastes where it, it, it's, it, it's, 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 yeah, it's gray hair. Almond, almond, that, that, that's a word in the, in the original language that, or, that the almond tree in Palestine was the first tree that bloomed in the springtime. Early blooming is actually what the word means, early blooming tree. And so in the context, and you can think about all those different things that, that you guys have mentioned, what is, what does the almond tree here, it says rod, the rod of the almond tree, the stick of the almond tree. 
What does the rod of the almond tree represent? Ma'am? Okay, it, it is, okay, it is an awakening. Keep going down that road. This is the first word of God. God is speaking to Jeremiah. Now, right away, there's going to be a warning. But look at the almond tree. I am getting ready to speak to you. And as you think about the rods that you guys just mentioned, that all sort of ties in a little bit together, doesn't it? The word of God. Thy rod and thy staff. You know, he's not talking about a stick there. He's talking, you know, the shepherd's staff, certainly that, but it's the word of God that protects us. And so here, very early in the book, the word of God is going to be coming to Jeremiah. I see an almond tree. Then you jump down to verse number 13. And you could go through the book of Jeremiah. And this is the first time we see it. In verse 13, he says, what else do you see? And he sees a boiling pot. And where is the boiling pot tilting toward? Now, the pot is not facing the north, is it? It's facing away from the north, which means it's facing south. And here, for the first time, we see in Jeremiah, and you can see it over and over and over again, devastation, the enemy, is going to come from the north. Now, and I, I should have a map up here, I don't. But in relationship to Israel and Judah, where is Babylon? Is it north, south, west, or east? It's east. It's east. But what's, what, is, what is there between Palestine and Babylon? Desert. And so when the Babylonian army comes... They're going to come from the north. That is where destruction is going to come from. And that, that is, in fact, what history shows us, is that the Babylonians came from the north. And so here, the boiling pot is going to be, it's, it's, it's pointed out toward the south. It's going to be great devastation, a seething pot, a boiling pot, pot and it is going to spill over. And the boiling mess that's in the pot the cauldron, and you think about those big old witches called, that, that's exactly what it is. It's going to be tilted out toward Judah and Jerusalem. There's trouble, trouble is coming, but who is in charge? Look at verse 14. Out of the, we'll, we'll look at this again. Out of the north, an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. A calamity's coming. That's what Jeremiah is saying here. 30 years before it ever happens. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yes, sir, go. Okay. Okay, and remember that Ezekiel and Jeremiah are living at about the same time. Now, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, is going to be taken off into during probably that first wave that, that we talked about. And, and Ezekiel, through the prophetic eye, is going to see what happens over the course of the next 20 years. And he's going to see the destruction of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel, too, is going to describe it as a boiling pot. Okay, let's go to chapter 2, verse number 13. Chapter 2, verse number 13. Here is another uh, example of, of uh, this, this. Boy, you, do you have this verse underlined? This is one of those verses in, in Jeremiah that you may want to have underlined. There's a lot of them. But look at Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Now he uses two different holders of water. He says, For my people have committed two evils. The first one is they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. I'll tell you what. Before we read this verse, 
and y'all got to stop me here, or I'll, I'll get way off the road, but let's go back up one verse. Look and see, be astonished. What do some of your Bibles say there instead of astonished? Sir? Be appalled. Somebody got a different word? Be shocked. Be shocked. Be appalled. O oh, you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. What do your Bible say there instead of horribly afraid? Shake with great fear. Somebody else. You be appalled. You be astonished. You be, what was the word you used, Chris? Appalled. What, what, what word, word did you use, Jeff, on the first one? You shake with great fear. You be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, for... In other words, he's talking to, to, to the host of heaven. He says, look at what my people have done. My chosen people, the children of Israel, whom I loved, who I chose, not because, you go back to Deuteronomy, not because they were better looking than anybody else, not because they had more numbers than anybody else, not because of a lot of earth, but just I, I chose them simply because I, why? Why did God choose Israel? Somebody knows. Why did he choose them? Because he loved them. That's it. Why does God choose us today? Do any of us deserve God's love? He loves us. Loved us so much he sent his only son. Let's keep reading. Look at what my people have done. They have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and instead hewed them out cisterns Broken cisterns that can hold no water. What's the difference in a fountain and a cistern? Fountain does continues. Okay, continues to put out, Chris. The fountain, God. Gives, 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 gives. Gives, 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 gives. While a cistern just simply holds. What happens to water in a cistern that doesn't get used? It becomes stagnant. But in this case, what's the problem with the cistern? They're, they're, they don't hold anything. What had the, what had the people done? I see you. What, are the, what, 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 had, what, what is the contrast here? The, not, 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 not just the law. That they had given up on God and instead were worshiping something that was absolutely worthless. Go, Jeff. I like the translation that kind of gives that impression. It says they dug their own private water tank. So they had their own private way of worshiping God that was not. Okay, Let, let's go down that road just a little bit. Because that's what this verse is talking about, is how they were worshiping God. Where did God tell them to worship Him? In, in Jerusalem. Yeah, in the Old Testament, they didn't come to church every Saturday. <laughs> they didn't come to church every Sunday. How often were they supposed to go to, I, I, I'm going to say this the wrong way, but play with me a little bit. How often did they go to church in the Old Testament? Only three times a year. Those made, that, that was the only three times that they, that they were commanded to go. The other 49 weeks out of the year, they just didn't work on Sabbath. But what did they want to do? Make it more convenient. Make their worship more convenient. Go, go, Carlton. Yes, sir. John chapter 4. You're, you're, you guys say you got to worship in Jerusalem. Had God said they needed to worship in Jerusalem? Yes, he had. But our fathers say you can worship right here in Mount Gerizim. And what did Jesus say? There's going to come a time very, very soon. It doesn't matter where you worship. What's going to be important is that you worship God in spirit and in truth. Yes, sir. Brother Jackson. Yeah. 
And that's what they were doing. Now, the, the northern tribes, <laughs> they had done it even worse. Remember that? That's where the whole thing got started with Jeroboam. You know, we're going we're to make a couple extra places of worship. And that's where the Samaritan woman got, got her deal. But now the people in Judah, what were they doing in Judah? Je Jeff, hold on just a second. What were they doing in Judah? Jeff mentioned private worship. What were they doing to do, make, 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 make their worship private? Okay, not, not only shrines inside their homes, they were making high places. When it talks about high places in the Old Testament, that's places where they built idols. They, they'd go out to a, a little uh, a, a garden in the, or, or, or tree forest on the mountain and they would build idols in high places. And so when you talk about making their own places of private worship, that's exactly what they were doing. And so you have traded... Worship for a living God who gives, 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 gives versus an idol worship, which is empty, worthless, meaningless. Go, Jeff. What, what chapter is that? Do you, do you have that real quick? Ezekiel 8, uh, even, in, even in the temple where they were supposed to be worshiping God, they had traded worship in for God for false worship. And in Ezekiel 8, you see Ezekiel peeping through a peephole <laughs> and seeing these priests and Levites doing all this, this, this false worship. Anybody else before we move on from the fountains? Th thanks for bringing that worship stuff up, Jeff. That, 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 that's exactly what this, this verse is about. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's go to chapter 6, verse number 6. Chapter 6, verse number 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Hew you down trees. What's hew mean? Cut down. Cut down trees. Cut down trees and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. Okay, what is, what is, what's being prophesied here? Okay, the destruction of Jerusalem, and how is the destruction of Jerusalem, how is it going to happen based on this prophecy? Okay, what did you say, Chris? By, by a military siege. They're going to cut down the trees, build ramps, and mounds against Jerusalem. Turn in your Bibles. Now, Jeff's already, Jeff's already jumped over here, we're so, so we're going to follow him right down the Ezekiel road. Jump over to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse number 2. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 2. Let's start in verse 1. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile. Now, here, here Jeff mentions Ezekiel doing object lessons. Here's an object lesson that Ezekiel did. You take a tile and lay it before you and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. You take a tile and you write the name Jerusalem on that tile. Then verse 2, lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mound against it, set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. Now jump over to Ezekiel chapter 24. Chapter 24, nope, 26, Ezekiel 26, verse number 8. Ezekiel 26, verse number 8. He 
He shall lay, slay with a sword your daughters in the field. He shall make a fort against you and cast a mount against thee and lift up the buckler against thee. What's a buckler? Okay, a, sh a shield? Sh shield wall? Go, go, Chris. Chris mentioned a, a, a big shield. They were big shields, but what they would do is put those shields together, and that would be a shield wall. And that's what would protect. So as they were shooting those arrows down to that boiling oil, it was still a pretty dangerous job to take buckets of dirt up to that mound. But that's exactly what's being described here, and that's exactly how, you know, it's, it's hard to beat a wall in. But if you can get to where you can run over the wall, and so that, that's what's being described here, and that's exactly what the Babylonians did. Now, now Chris mentioned they would cut down the, 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 the trees. What kind of trees, and you know this answer, what kind of trees did they have around Jerusalem? They had fig trees, olive trees, Almond trees, okay, that's the three, yeah, you got bad. That, that, you know, they may have had some others. I would suspect that they wouldn't have cut down those, those trees. Why? Food. Food. But there were other trees around that they're using. They didn't haul this lumber in from Babylon, but they are, they are cutting down trees and bringing them in to batter. You know, you, you see those old medieval catapults that they're throwing stones in and throwing balls of fire. That's how, they would, that's how they would defeat a city. And so that's what, as we go back to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, they're going to cut down trees and they're going to build mounds. Let's go now to chapter 13, verse number 1. Chapter 13, verse number 1. Here, Jeremiah is told to go put on a linen girdle. What color is linen? You go put on a white girdle. Now, whether that was underwear or whether it was a, 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 a sash around, what do you suppose it was? Was it underwear or a sash? Sash. As you look at these first few verses, what does that sash what do you suppose that sash, well, let's tell the story first. He tells him to go get you a, a brand new linen girdle. You put it on and you don't wash it. And you wear it. And then it says, you go to the river Euphrates. And you put that sash, that clean sash, in the muddy river bank of the river Euphrates. This is all in the first six or seven verses there. And then he, at some point in time, and we don't know how long, God tells him to go back and get the sash. And when he goes back and gets the sash, it, what, what, what does it do? It's dirty. It's worthless. Depending on how long it was, by that time it may have, had, it may have been rotted. It may have had all kind of holes eaten in it by the crabs. You know, who knows? But it's absolutely worthless. And so the first question is, what does that sash represent, so, say it, Judah, 
okay? Judah. Precious linen was white. Of course, the priest wore linen, but so did other people. So if it was put on the outside, it represents proud Judah. You take Judah's pride, and now you're going to go and bury it at the river Euphrates. Jeff, does your Bible say Euphrates? It does not. Okay, Pareth. Now, so some of your Bibles are going to say Pareth. Some of your Bibles are going to say Euphrates. It's a, it's a, the translators have translated. Do do why did it say Pareth, Jeff? Do you know? Uh, I have a note here that says, uh, the village now called Wadi for about three miles. Okay, there you go. Para is a village three miles from Jerusalem. And Annas. And Annas was a, a home of prophets and also a home of Jeremiah. Okay. So, based on, and, and I, I'm going to argue one way here. Some versions say Para, three miles away from Jerusalem. Other versions say Euphrates. Where is the Euphrates River? Almost, it, it is the dividing line between Babylon and the broadest extent of the land that God gave the children of Israel. Where else in the Bible do you read the river Euphrates? It's in Revelation. And in Revelation, what does the river Euphrates represent a line, a dividing line between God's people and God's enemies. And in the book of Revelation, the, book, the, the river Euphrates dries up. And there's a great battle there. What's that the battle of? What? Armageddon. Okay, that, that, that's where that battle is, is fought. In any case, God tells him to take it to this river. Later on, let me see, I think I wrote it down in my Bible. Later on, in the book of Jeremiah, we're in chapter 13, verse 1. Ah, shucks. I didn't write it down. And I don't remember. It's around chapter 49 or so. Later on, Jeremiah is, when Nebuchadnezzar comes into Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar talks to Jeremiah. In fact, the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was well acquainted with Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar pulls Jeremiah out of, out of a dungeon and says, this, this, leave this guy go. The suggestion might be, when did Jeremiah come into contact with Nebuchadnezzar? As you read the, the, the chronology of this book, Jeremiah in chapter 13 is in a little trouble with the authorities, and they're looking to kill him. And so the suggestion is that perhaps God told Jeremiah to go 800 miles away for a period of time, to keep Jeremiah safe. And providentially, perhaps, this is where Jeremiah may have come into acquaintance of Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't, isn't that interesting? If that's the case, Jeremiah traveled 800 miles one way to the river Euphrates, and then traveled 800 miles back. The Bible right here tells us in these first few verses of chapter 13 that at some point God tells him to go get it and go back home. Any comments on that? When you try to start putting all this stuff together, the providence of God shouts from, from, from these pages. Jeff, did you have anything on that? Okay. That, that's the difference if you're looking at a translation of comparisons of some scholars. You know, what makes a scholar? Somebody says they are, right? 
and, and, and so some of them will, will, will argue that God just told him to go three miles away, while others will say it was a 1,600-mile journey for Jeremiah. And that, that period of time, and the Bible doesn't tell us here, that's right, when God tells you to come back, you take these, you take these people, and, and that's why I sort of think it's Euphrates. These people, my people, who are proud and arrogant, they're going to be taken across the river Euphrates, but at some time, they're going to what? They're going to get to come back. There it is right here in these first few verses of chapter 13, which is still years and years and years away from all of that happening. Okay, let's go to verse 12, chapter 13, verse 12. And in this one, God, God uses bottles of wine. And he says, Thus saith the Lord, every bottle shall be filled with wine. Now, for a bottle to be filled, what does it have to be? Empty. These are empty jars. And they shall say unto thee, Do we certainly... God says, fill them up. Then they say, somebody say something. Then they say, do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Jeff, read yours. Of course we know that all the wine bags should be filled with wine. Fill them up. Well, it's sort of sarcastic there. Don't you know? We'll pick up there next week. Were they drunk, or does drunk here mean something else? Think about where people are drunk in the Bible.
Good morning. Sounds good for uh, everybody talking uh, and fellowshipping this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Chaffee Road Church of Christ. Uh, we're happy you've chose here to come and worship with us. If you're visiting, uh, we ask that you uh, stick around and let us get to know you a little bit better. Uh, if you would, uh, take a, uh, our visitors and members alike, if you would, take a card in the pew in front of you and fill it out and pass it to the center aisle, and those will be picked up after uh, services. Uh, have some uh, announcements. Uh, January 20th is the men's breakfast, breakfast with the elders at 9 a.m. Uh, we met yesterday with the ladies, and uh, there were about 31 ladies there. It was a good, good meeting, uh, good questions, and, uh, and uh, as always, the, uh, the Dean Catering uh, uh, breakfast was awesome. So uh, um, also on uh, January 20th is the Lakeside Church of Christ will host a Ladies' Day. Uh, there's a sign up on the bulletin board. Uh, sign up today uh, if you plan to attend so that we can RSVP. Also, January 26th and 27th is Sister Sister Lectureship. The details and registration are available at uh, cocsistertosister.org. That's in the bulletin. Uh, the theme is Survivors, Tried, Purified, and Certified. Uh, the Friday evening program will be in person at the Arlington Road Church of Christ from 4 to 8 p.m., and dinner will be served. Um, our own Kristen Bennett will be one of the speakers Friday evening, uh, and then the sessions on Saturday will be virtual only from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and you must register to partic participate in either of the, both the in-person sessions and the Zoom virtual sessions. So in order to participate, you need to register. Also looking out uh, in February, February 23rd through 25th is Yes Weekend in Valdosta, Georgia for the youth in sixth grade through 12th and college students as well. The theme is Big Decisions. Uh, we plan to go there for the day only on Saturday. Uh, and then after, there will be a brief meeting also tonight uh, after the evening services for any students or adults that are interested in attending. And the, uh, the bulletin board, uh, see the bulletin board for schedules and uh, uh, the speakers as well. March 29th through 31st is last leaders in Orlando. And then even though it's in May and the weather's not May-like out there, uh, be planning in May for our gospel meeting with Joe Wells um, and uh, be praying for that, that it'll be a success. Uh, we have uh, also one other announcement. Uh, David's uh, Tuesday classes will not be meeting uh, this Tuesday. Uh, as David will be at the Florida School of Preaching Lectureships. Uh, however, in talking with David, uh, he said he will be back for the early Wednesday service here. Uh, we have a number uh, on our uh, prayer request, and uh, for those we need to remember in prayer, and I've got uh, some additional that's not in the bulletin. Um, Mike Kokenhauer is, is scheduled to have vascular surgery on February 19th, so remember him in your prayers. Also, um, Ann Brookins is tentatively scheduled for surgery for growth on her ovary at the end of January. And um, uh, she, she also is uh, continuing to ask for prayers and she would appreciate all prayers at this time. Um, Sandra Crum continues with chemotherapy for breast cancer. Elaine Hollowell was hospitalized for several days last week and, but she's now home. Um, Heather Sasson was hospitalized last week as well, and she's now home and doing much better. Uh, Mary Hazen is home following a hospitalization and stay at rehab. Uh, Dennis Schubert, uh, Brian Schubert's father, uh, is recovering from surgery. Uh, Dennis lives in Tallahassee uh, to repair an injury to his arm. So remember uh, Dennis, uh, Brian's dad, in your prayers as well. And Jenny McDonald, uh, David and Lucretia's daughter-in-law, had surgery last Friday, and um, about 20% of her kidney was removed for cancer, and uh, she ha will have chemotherapy following that. So continue to remember Jenny and, and, uh, and her family in your prayers as well. Uh, additional uh, announcements here. The joiners are very thankful for uh, the cards, the telephone calls, and the prayers, and they just wanted the congregation to know that. And also, um, Sarah and Austin Trout have been out sick this week, uh, if, you're, if you're missing them. 
And then uh, one other announcement is on the, uh, this is please pray for the grandfather of Heidi. It's Colin Smith's girlfriend. Uh, her grandfather fell and broke his hip and is having surgery today. Uh, his name is uh, Howard Humberg. So please remember Howard Humberg in your prayers as well uh, that the hip surgery may be successful. Uh, serving this morning, our song leader is J.D. Blackshear. Our scripture reading is Mason Cooper. Opening prayer is Mike Berry. Presiding at the communion is Harold Thomas. Assisting is Nathan Dean, Arthur Bailey, Travis James, Walter Young. And presenting our lesson this morning is David McDonald. And collecting the cards after the service is Levi Dean, Warren James, and Joshua Bailey. And our closing prayer will be Brother, by Brother Walter Bennett. If you would, um, grab a Bible and we'll now have our scripture reading. Good evening. The scripture reading today will be Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 through 21. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 through 21. And it reads, The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Thy sun shall be no more no more go down. Neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy righteous peop thy people also shall be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I am glorified. Our first song this morning will be Firm Foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Sing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. This is the Hughes version we've been working on on our uh, song class nights. John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst.
Please pray with me. Father, we come before you with joy and thanksgiving. Joy because you are our God, the only God, the great I am. We come before you with thanksgiving because of all the blessings you have given us. The gift of life. The gift of love the gift of your Son, through which we have access to your grace through him. We thank you so much. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together, to sing your praises, to worship you, and to hear part, another part of your word. Father, we thank you for this congregation and all the congregations of the Church of Christ in this country and throughout the world, but especially this congregation at Chafee Road. May we continue to worship as one in faith and in unity. Father, we have members in our congregation that are in bad health. We ask that you will be with them. You know who they are. You know their needs. Comfort them. And if it be thy will, bring them back to a portion of their health. Father, we also have grieve, grieved ones. We have lost family members. Be with them. Comfort them as only you can. Father, we hear that a worship you are only human. And we fall short of your glory at times. We pray that you will look down and forgive us for those times, Lord. We thank you for our elders, our deacons, our minister, and each and every member of this congregation. Father, we pray that the things that we will hear in a portion of your word today will be in accordance with our will and that we will study them and we will take them into our heart and live in such a manner as that we'll be a light to the community. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the communion, we'll sing Victory in Jesus, number 819 in the songbook. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.
As we gather around the Lord's table to partake of this memorial feast, let us remember what it says on the front here. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus was telling us to do this to remember his death, resurrection, and we also need to remember that in our heart, what he done for each and every one of us, he came to this as a human being to pay our sin debt, a debt that we can never, ever repay. And sometimes I think that we as people may take things for granted. But Jesus loved us so much, he never took anything for granted. In fact, he could have called 10,000 angels and not be crucified. But he loved each and every one of us so much that he asked his cup be passed from him, but it said if it was God's will. So he did the things that he did for us. And we need to always remember that. We have the emblems here that represents the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At this time, let us give thanks for the loaf by Brother Bailey. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another wonderful day you've allowed our eyes to see. We thank you for allowing us to come here once again and study another portion of your word. At this time, we ask that you bless this bread that represents the Lord's body. Bless all those that are taking it, Father, will examine themselves according to your scriptures. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, let's give thanks for the fruit of vine, my brother, Nathan Dean. Bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with this uh, feast that represents the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask that you be with us at this time to, uh, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood, that we dwell on the sacrifice that was necessary and the the, the blood that was shed from the perfect Lamb of God, the, the blameless, 
the, uh, the pure so that, that, that our, our filthiness, so that our sin could be, could be cleansed. Be with us now and help us to dwell on these things. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Separate and part of the Lord's Supper, we are commanded to give according to the scriptures. At this time, let us give thanks for the offering. Our Father and our God in heaven, we are truly thankful once again for another opportunity that we have to come together this Lord's Day, Heavenly Father. We thank you for our health, our homes, our ways of making a living. Heavenly Father, you have provided everything that we need. And Father, we just thank you so much for that. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we prepare to give back a portion of that which thou hast so richly blessed us with, that we would do so with a cheerful heart, Heavenly Father. We pray that these monies will be used for the intended use to build thy kingdom here, not only at Chafee Road, but throughout this community. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we give, we will give so, Heavenly Father, knowing that all that we have and all that we'll ever have come from thee and thee alone, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for all that we have. It's in your Son, Christ's name we give thanks for all things. Amen. Amen.
you'd like to mark in your songbook for the invitation, it'll be Flee as a Bird, which I think is 128, 138, somewhere around there. And then uh, our song before the lesson, let's all stand as we sing, number 530. It comes out of Psalm 23, verse 6. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning on the second Sunday of the new year. The book of Isaiah is the second by chapter longest book in the Bible, 66 chapters. Some have called it a miniature Bible because that's the number of books we have in the Bible. Isaiah is a prophet. And Isaiah saw some things in reality. In his reality, he saw the northern kingdom of Israel fall to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And then he saw the Assyrians attack Jerusalem and Jerusalem spared by God in 701 B.C. That date 722 is important in Bible history because it is the time that the Assyrians took the northern kingdom off into captivity for them never to return as a country again. But the book of Isaiah is full of prophetic visions. And some of those visions have immediate fulfillment. 
some of those visions have fulfillment right now or in, in the near future. And when I say immediate, I'm talking about the near future. Some of those visions have relevance not only to things that are going on in the near future, but to Christ and his church and his kingdom. And then there are some things that Isaiah has to say that perhaps, that perhaps have their fulfillment right away and in Christ and in his kingdom, the church, and perhaps even a more distant fulfillment in heaven. And so it is, when Isaiah prophesied, he saw the fall of the Assyrians to the Babylonians in 607. He saw the fall of the Egyptians and lots of other nations. He saw the destruction of Jerusalem and Judah in, 60, or in 606 B.C., in 597 B.C., and ultimately the complete and utter destruction and burning of Jerusalem and the temple in 587 B.C. He also prophesied that in 536, 70 years later, the Jews would be allowed to return from captivity. And he by name prophesied some 200 years before this king ever lived by the name of King Cyrus, a Persian, who would allow that to happen. That's what he saw. Isaiah saw a description of God's judgment upon many nations, including Judah in his book. And he saw their return from Babylonian captivity. He saw them taken captive, and then he saw them return to Jerusalem. And so it is, Isaiah pictures, beginning in about chapter 40, different kinds of servants. The most important servant being the one in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. But he also saw the remnant coming back. He also saw the kingdom of Christ, spiritual Israel, being set up in a way that would help the world. And he also saw a glimpse, if you will, of the grandeur of heaven. And it is about that, and I'm going to back up here in just a second. I thought I had that slide in here again, but I don't guess I do. It is about that that we want to talk about this morning. In the verses that Mason read to us just a few minutes ago, in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 through 21, there are three parts to those verses that give us, if you will, a glimpse of heaven. Three insights into the prospect of heaven. In chapter 19, or chapter 60, verse 19, it talks about the Lord giving an everlasting light. In Revelation chapter 21, verse number 3, the revelator says, I heard a voice. Behold, well, I lost it. Let me jump over here to chapter 22. Let me do 22.5. He says in Reve Isaiah 60, 19, that, that there's going to be a light. In Revelation 22, verse 5, and there shall be no night there. They will need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. God is going to be the everlasting light in heaven. Also in chapter 60, verse 19, it talks about the fact that God will be your glory. Glory is that idea of splendor and majestic grandeur, and that's what heaven is going to be. And then in verse 20 of chapter 60, he talks about the days of mourning 
shall be ended. Back over in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4, the Bible says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Let me ask you this morning, do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? And the fact is, if we knew nothing more about heaven than what we get a glimpse of in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19, the fact that, that God is going to be there, that there's not going to be any more darkness, that there's not going to be any more sorrow or pain or crying, that in and of itself would make us want to go. But you know, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, those Old Testament characters were always looking for home. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 10, Abraham wanted a city whose builder and maker is God. Later on in that same chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 10 through 14, the Bible tells us that they, others, were looking for a heavenly country, a city prepared for them. Paul had a strong desire to go and be with Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. And then you look at Mark chapter 14, verse 22. And Mark reports that on the night before Jesus died in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus was distressed and anxious. And in verse 22 of Mark, that word distressed, one of the meanings is that Jesus was homesick. You'll recall that he'd asked his three closest disciples to go with him further into the garden. And they'd gone to sleep. Jesus knows what's getting ready to happen. And as he goes to God in prayer that night, just hours before he's going to have to suffer unparalleled hurt. He's homesick. Jesus was homesick for heaven. Today and next week, the Lord willing, I want to talk to you about two very real places. Two very real places. The first place we want to talk about is heaven. And perhaps, you, you know, we talk about heaven, but, but maybe for, for, for some of us, there, there's some questions about heaven. And what we want to do this morning is ask some of those questions. And the first question we want, and we're going to, we're going to look at, we're going to, we're going to reference, a, we're going to read some, and we're going to reference a lot of Bible verses today. We won't be reading them all, but they're all going to be up on the screen. So you can, you know, take notes or take a picture of them all at once as we go through each one of these points. But you know, the first question might be, what is heaven? What is heaven? Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse number 2, In my Father's house there are many mansions or rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is a real place. It's not some imaginary place. It's something that Jesus is there right now preparing for us. As we looked at in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 and verse 16, heaven is a city whose builder and maker is in fact God. It is a heavenly country. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 11. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, Peter tells us that heaven is an everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a place, it's a city, it's a country, it's an everlasting kingdom. In Revelation chapter 21, verse number 1, and we get this reference in Isaiah as well, but several times in the book of Revelation, the revelator tells us that in chapter 22, verse number, or 21, verse number 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Heaven is not going to be 
a refurbished earth. Heaven is not going to be something that, 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 that has been, that, that's recycled. It is going to be brand new. And it's going to be a brand new place for those who are there. That's what Jesus is preparing for us right now. And so it's going to be totally different. Heaven does not belong to the cosmos. Heaven doesn't belong to this universe. You know, so often we look up in heaven. Well, we'll talk about that in just a second. But if you think that, that God is somewhere up in those, up somewhere in, in the universe or the universes or in the skies, 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 10 tells us that the heavens and the earth are going to be burned up. They're going to be melted with a fervent heat. There's what God created on those first six days of creation will be no more. What he's doing is creating a new place for us. It's a new heaven, a new earth, a new place for us to live. Heaven will be in you. Everything that we know in this universe will be destroyed when Christ comes again. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Heaven is a place. But where is heaven? Heaven is, in fact, up from where we are. In John chapter 6, verse 38, the Bible tells us that Jesus came down from heaven. In Mark 16, 19, and Luke 12, 24, 51, and then again in Acts 1, 11, the Bible tells us that Jesus ascended back up into heaven. He came down, he went up. Heaven is up there someplace but not in the cosmos that we see. One day, Jesus is going to come again when he descends. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16. The Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise First, heaven is where God is. Go back in your Old Testaments to the book of 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, King Solomon is dedicating the temple. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, we see one of the great prayers in the Bible. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse number Twenty-seven. The Bible says, Solomon says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. Nothing can contain God. God cannot be contained. Yet, God, slip over to the book of Psalms, God has a center of operations, if you will. He has a command post, if you will. Look in Psalm chapter 33, verse number 13. Psalm chapter 33, verse number 13 and 14. The psalmist talking about God and where God is and, 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 and the things about God, beginning in verse 13, the Lord looks from heaven, he beholds all the sons of men. Where God is, on his throne, he can see everyone in the world. From the place of his habitation, he looks upon all the inhabitants of the earth. God can see all. God can not only see all, but God knows all. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139, one of the great Psalms. Psalm 139. God is also 
omniscient. Just as he's omnipresent, he's omniscient. Psalm chapter 139, beginning in verse number 7. The Bible says, where shall I go from thy spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I, the psalmist, ascends into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Behold, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yes, the darkness hides not from you, but the night shineth as the days, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Even though God is omnipresent, God is not going to be in hell. God is our Father in heaven. Jesus started out the model prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Heaven, Philippians chapter 1, verse or chapter 3, verse number 20, is the place that we look to for the return of Christ. We know that Christ is coming back. He's going to descend from heaven. And heaven is where our hearts, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, ought to be focused on. And heaven, according to Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, is where we ought to be depositing our treasures right now. Lay not up for yourself treasures on this earth, which most and rough doth corrupt and thieves steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures which are in heaven. Knowing, where, knowing that heaven is where God is and that hell is where God is not, ought to by itself motivate us to go to heaven. But what will heaven be like? i got to tell you, you know, as a kid, maybe some of us still as adults, maybe you don't like to sing. And so if heaven's going to be a place where that's all we do is sing, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, heaven's a place that's going to be magnificent. I would suggest to you that in Revelation chapter 4, verses, or chapter four and chapter 5, describes the great throne room of God. And in that great throne room of God, we see, we see 24 elders with their crowns, and, and we see them dressed in white robes. We see four beasts. We see lightning and thunder. We see a great big sea of glass, of, of pure glass. We see all of those things, thousands and thousands, tens and tens of thousands of angels and, 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 and worshiping God. And so heaven is going to be a, a glorious place. It's going to be a place that, 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 that's beautiful. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. It is a place, I want to suggest to you as you get into Revelation 21 and 22, and as we talked in our ladies' class, you know, a lot of times if you've heard sermons on Revelation 21 and 22, the sermon has been about heaven. But as we talked about in our ladies' class, I'd like to suggest to you, and as you read those two chapters, there are also a lot of descriptions in Revelation 21 and 22 about the church. Okay, one of those prophecies has got fulfillment in the church and in, in, in heaven. You, talk, you read about the Lamb, the Bride of Christ, and all those descriptors that, that certainly describe the church. But the fulfillment is also in heaven. And how heaven has got great, it's built on 12, on 12 beautiful, beautiful stones, jewels of stone. And how the gates of heaven, that are always open though, those gates are made of pearl. And it's just a glorious, glorious place. And you look at Revelation 21 and 22, and you can see the beauty of heaven. The streets of gold, the gates of pearl, the walls and foundations that are built on all of those jewels. Heaven, a place filled with the glory of God. You'll, you'll go back a couple years in, in, in our theme. We talked about Isaiah chapter 6. And you'll recall in the vision that Isaiah saw 
he didn't, what he saw was the train, the veil of God that filled the entire temple. God is a glorious God and that's what is in heaven. But I tell you, as we were studying the book of 1 John, I invite your attention to 1 John chapter 3 verse number two. And as, as, as you look at heaven, and this, this struck me, and I don't know that, that I'd ever thought about it like this anymore or before, but look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. One of the things about heaven, behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We're going to be something different in heaven. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute or two. But we know that where he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. The idea that I get from that verse is that when we go to heaven, we're going to be just like Jesus Christ. We're not going to be old David McDonald anymore or, or you know, that, that rascal Mike Berry. We're going to be like Jesus Christ. Anybody who in heaven and, and all that goes with what being like Jesus Christ means. You know, we studied the life of Christ two years ago. How he dealt with people. How he dealt with things. All of uh, the, the perfection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be like, just like him. Anything and everything that would interfere with perfection or our peace will not be in heaven. There will be no more tears, no more death, no more blindness, no more bad knees, Marcin. No more sadness, no more loneliness. Might I suggest, I don't know, Jeff, you might get on to me for this. Might I suggest that we will be forever young? That doesn't mean we go back to teenage years. But, but we're not going to have any of the hurts, any of the problems that come with old age. We're going to be having new bodies. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. But let me ask you, have you ever thought about when are we going to heaven? Well, as of 1126, not right now. Okay, we're, not going to, we're not going there yet. And in fact, as we've talked about before, we won't be going to heaven immediately after we die. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Jesus tells about a rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus, the poor beggar, dies, and the angels take him up into, up into paradise. The rich man is taken down into torment, a place that is hot, and a place that he just, all he wants is just a little touch of water on his tongue. But there is no water fountain. There is no water bottles in the refrigerator. He can't get any help. But we're not talking about that place today. We're talking about heaven. Heaven is a place, but it's not a place we go to right after we die. We get to go to paradise, Abraham's bosom. Now, between, and that's the Hadean world, that's Hades. And in the Hadean world, that is the room of paradise, the room of torment, and then in between, there's a great gulf. There's a great, another great big room that nobody can go from up here, down here to up here, or from up here to down here. Because you see, it's appointed for us all to die, and after that, the judgment. We don't get to make any amends after we die. We either go to paradise or torment, but that is not heaven and hell. At the end of time, when Jesus comes again, there will be a great judgment day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. The Bible says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that are dead. Don't sorrow, even as others, which have no hope, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus 
will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of the Lord of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall we be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so it is. Christ has not come at 1129. But he may come at 1140 today. Those that are dead will rise first in Christ. And then the rest of us will be taken up. And all will go before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 tells us that all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Giving account for what they've done, whether they be good or whether they be evil. A few minutes ago, J.D. read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 through 58, 56 and 57. Just before verse 56, it talks, he read, read the verse that said, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Okay, just before that, he says, we don't need to be ignorant of what's going to happen. He says that you're going to, right now you've got a corruptible body. You've got a mortal body. You've got a body that gets old. You've got a body that, that, that sooner or later your eyesight's not as good as it was. You've got ears that don't hear like they used to hear. You've got knees and ankles and legs that don't work like they used to. You've got gray hair instead of beautiful black or blonde. You know, that, that's just the way it is in this life. But in our new life, in heaven, we won't have any of those corruptible characteristics. The humanness, if you will, will be gone. What will be left is a spirit. A spirit that doesn't... Now, let, let, let me keep going before, before I get off, off, get off base too much. We will have that spirit. The dead, okay, and, and the, Lord, the Lord is going to... Be, everything's going to be destroyed. I tell you what, but I almost messed up here. Started answering some other questions. I need to get past this one. What are we going to do in heaven? What are we going to do in heaven? The first thing we're going to get to do is live forever. When we drink the water of life and we eat of the tree of life. And that's in that first line. I'm not going to read all these verses, but that, uh, th these all are lined up with, with the points that we're getting ready to make. We're going to be confessed before God. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, and of course in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 30, 33, the Bible says that Christ will confess us. If we confess Christ before men, he's going to confess us before the Father who's in heaven. But if we don't confess him, then he will not in fact confess us. And so it is in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 5. We will, con but I will confess your name, his name, before my Father and before his angels. We're going to rule with Christ. The book of Revelation tells us that as Christians, we're ruling right now. We're going to reign with Christ. We are going to live in eternal joy, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 9. We're going to worship God with the Lamb of God. We looked at Revelation chapter 4 and 5 just a few minutes ago. We are going to be with God. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 3. We will receive an inheritance. Just a few minutes ago, we looked at 2 Corinthians 5.10. We're going to give an account. And those that have done good will get to go to heaven. Those who are in heaven by the grace of God will get to live with him and serve him for an eternity. Revelation chapter 7, verse 15. Here's where I want to go, though. Turn in your Bibles to, to, to Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Matthew chapter 8, 11 gives us some insight about heaven. And this is where I started to go just a second ago, and I didn't need to get there yet. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, the Bible says that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. 
That verse right there suggests that we are going to know each other in heaven. And so, now jump over to chapter 22, verse number 30. Chapter 22, verse number 30. Jesus is still talking. And he says, in the resurrection, he's talking about in heaven. He says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Put those two verses together. It's going to be one big reunion in heaven. We're going to know each other, but then based on what Jesus says here, we are not going to have the same relationships that we have in this life that we will have in heaven. And as, as, I, was, as I was thinking about this and, and, and talked to Lucretia, she, you know, she, she, uh, I love being married to her. And on some days, she loves being married to me. In fact, just this week, she said, you know, we're happy. And she wasn't telling me that to convince me. But, you know, there are some days that she really gets aggravated with me. Ashley, have you been there yet with Brian? I got to tell you, I saw my first head slap this last week in a marriage seminar. And that was when one of our deacon's wives, I mean, you know, I've seen the elbow punch before, but I would never say her name, but Brandy gave Nathan a head slap in, 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 in one of those. You know, there are some times in, in this life in our relationships, whether it's a marriage relationship or with friends or with brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers, that we get aggravated. But there is no aggravation in heaven. And so that sort of tells, we're going to know each other, and we're going to love that we're there. And so it's going to be one big family reunion. I know uh, Lisa, Eric, you might remember, they used to talk about having a big old family reunion of uh, you know, people from, from school in the southwest corner of heaven. You know, let's just, we'll meet at the southwest corner of heaven. Now, if heaven doesn't have any boundaries, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but, you know, we'll get it figured out, won't we? We're going to know. But we're not going to have the same relationships that aggravate us. I think that's what those two verses put together say. And so, we're going to be like Christ. And we're going to get to see God's face, but then it's going to be glorious and wondrous. But the last question, who's going to heaven? Who's going to heaven? Luke chapter 18, verse number 16 tells us that there will be little children in heaven. Lots of little children. Any child who is not accountable, any person who is not accountable, who doesn't know the difference in right and wrong, will be in heaven. Suffer the little children to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But Revelation chapter 14 tells us that those that are in heaven are in Christ. Blessed are those, Revelation 14, 13, that die in Christ. Those who are accountable must be in Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Paul says, Know ye not that so many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. And so it's by the blood of Christ that we are made righteous. And only the righteous can be in heaven. Sin, there will be no hint of sin. There will be no temptation in heaven. We've got to be in Christ and we've got to be forgiven and made righteousness. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 3 tells us that Christians' names are written in the book of life. To get to go to heaven, our names need to be written in the book of life. That's essential to going to heaven. And, and as first, second Peter, turn in your Bibles to Second Peter, and there's lots of verses we could go to. Another one is Titus. But Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11 tells us that by entering Christ, we're to live a certain kind of way. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. The Bible says, seeing this, that all things will be dissolved. What means a person's ought you to be? Be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God, where in the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. 
Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. If you want to go to heaven, be diligent now, that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother, brother Paul, also according to the wisdom, gives unto you him which hath written also unto you, as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, see ye know these things before. Have a beware, lest you be led away with the error of the wicked. Fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The very next page in the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, tells us that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And with the blood of Jesus, Christ His Son, it cleanses us all from all sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all on righteousness. Those going to heaven must be enrolled there. But you know, simply wanting to go to heaven, simply just being a good person is not going to be enough. Jesus says at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, beginning in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Being in Christ, living faithfully and continually, being cleansed by Christ's blood through the grace of God gives us the hope and the prospect of heaven. A couple last verses and then the lesson will be yours. And I apologize for going over today. A lot of stuff about heaven. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3, verse number 5. Look at what Jesus said. He that overcomes... The same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. At the end of the book, in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 20, John says that Jesus said, Surely I come quickly. Have you ever been homesick? I know some adults in here when they were kids that went to Bible camp and they got homesick. They were homesick just about the time mom and daddy left on Sunday afternoon. And by Monday night, they were, you know, they were basket cases. They wanted to go home. How about his grandparents? Have you ever had your grandkids stay over at night and they're supposed to spend the night and about 7 o'clock when it's time to go to bed, they're homesick, they want to go see mom? They want to go see dad. They want to go home. They, shoot, mom might be right next door, but they still want to go home. I would never talk about any of my grandsons like that. But you know, we've all, perhaps, you go off to college. You go off in the military. You're on that boat of 5,000 people, and, you're away, and there's no way to get back. You get homesick, don't you? We know what that is about. Let me ask you. Do you want to go home? If you want to go home and you've not made the proper preparation to get into the grace of God through the watery grave of baptism right now is your chance as together we stand and as we sing.
David, thank you for that message. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today. And I uh, would like to invite you back this evening at 5 o'clock. Uh, looks right, I'm getting announcements. I don't think I did. Um, nope, I think, I think uh, we'll just have a, we'll have a member of our services again this, this evening at 5. And we'll have a closing song and a dismissal prayer. Thanks. Close with a step-by-step. -step. Psalm 17, verse 5 says, My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. And then 63, verse 1, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land there is, where there is no water. Stand as we go to God in a word of prayer. Holy and all righteous God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father, as we come before you again this morning, we are so thankful, Father, for another day of life you have given us, for the opportunity that we have to assemble ourselves here together, Father, in one accord, to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Father, so much for the lesson we heard today, and we pray that we will. Continue to study and meditate on your word that we may always grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, so much for your word, Father, lamp to our feet and light to our path, that as we study and, 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 and learn your word, Father, that it will guide us home one day. We thank you, Father, for this congregation, Father, your congregation throughout the world, Church of Christ, but we especially thank you for the Chafer Road congregation with our leadership and our elders, Father, our deacon, our ministers, and we are grateful to each and every member that we have. We pray, Father, that we will always study your word and meditate on your word and let your word penetrate our heart, Father, that will make us better people, better Christians in your sight. We thank so much for our health and strength, and we know we got many among us, Father, who are not as fortunate as we are, those that are going through different type of treatment, Father, those who are in nursing home, or those who will be on the bed of affliction. May we continue to pray for them and, and keep them encouraged and keep them uplifted and be your will. May you restore them to the much needed health. We will remember those, Father, who are spiritual weak at this time, those who used to walk with us, but for some reason, Father, they so fit not to walk with us anymore. We just pray for them that you will keep them, Father, that we will do something, that we will say something that will cause them to, to truly examine themselves, Father, to help them to realize that they're lost in that condition and the need to come back to you for the everlasting too late. Thank you, Father, so much for your son and for his sacrifice that he gave on our behalf, and may we live our life and live in sacrifice unto thee. We pray, Father, you will dismiss us now in your care and bring us back on the next appointed time that we may study your word once again. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.